As we go through the story today, we will grab some lessons from four characters that we see in our short story. And I'm sure as we uh, consider each of them, we will find ourselves maybe um, acting like each of them throughout our lives, some that we will want to align ourselves with and some that we might not. And hopefully today it might motive us, motivate us to change our ways. Um, when I told uh, some friends, I actually did this talk last week at Riverwood. Um, sorry, I didn't write a fresh one. <laughs> I don't like writing them. Um, when I told my mates uh, the other night at dinner what I was going to be talking about the next day, I said, it's on changing your ways. Uh, they very much laughed at me and said, Jeremy, you're the most stubborn person we know. <laughs> you eat the same thing every day. Um, you do the same thing every day. You, you're not changing anything. And so uh, this exhort applies very much to me as it does to all of us. Um, so our story starts, um, incidentally, uh, in the chapter 7, where we... Um, find that the scribes and the Pharisees decide that it's time to get rid of Jesus and they start plotting against him. And at the end of chapter 7, that night all the people returned to their homes while we find that Jesus himself went to the Mount of Olives, no doubt to spend the night in prayer. And in the morning, uh, at the crack of dawn, Jesus heads to the temple and we read in verse 2 there, Early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. Um, now, this wasn't just some small crowd, I can't imagine. Normally Jesus had thousands around him, and I'm sure in the temple they would have fitted a lot of people. There would have been hundreds, if not thousands of people sitting at Jesus' feet as he sat there and taught them, and Jesus himself was sitting. So you can imagine the disruption to the crowd when we read verse 3 and 4. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. So you can imagine everybody sitting there listening to our Lord and as these scribes and these Pharisees, a group of men, drag this woman caught in the act of adultery. She would have been crying, no doubt. She, she, who knows what she was wearing? And they drag her through the middle of all these hundreds of people and stand her there in front of the Lord. You know, here's a group of men, the scribes and the Pharisees. They know the law back to front. They studied it every single day. They wrote the law out all the time. I'm pretty sure they spent most of their time arguing with others about points of the law. And here they are, they find this woman that has broken the law and they sit her in the midst of the people. Have you ever thought, how were they able to find this woman? Have you ever wondered that? Maybe someone tipped them off that there was an affair happening. Or, I think it's highly unlikely, but they just happened to stumble across this woman caught in adultery. I think it's interesting that they found this woman sinning and they didn't try to help her. And do you think we can be like this? Do you think we can be like the scribes and the Pharisees? Do you go getting around looking for faults in other people? Do you find their faults and try to shame them? Do we find our day, spend our days scrolling through Facebook and Instagram, looking at what other people are doing, instead of when we see somebody that needs help, we reach out and help them and show compassion for them? Being experts in the law, the Pharisees challenged Jesus. They said to Jesus, Moses in the law condemned, commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? Well, they were right, weren't they? If you turn with me to Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 10, it tells us they were on the money. Leviticus 20 and verse 10 says this, 
And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbour's wife, the adulterer and adulteress shall surely be put to death. It was a trick question what they were asking our Lord. They were trying to tra trap him. You see, if Jesus had have said, yes, go ahead and stone her, they would have dragged him off to the Romans and said, this man is making his own judgments and saying somebody should be put to death. And then the, judge, the Romans would have had a case against him. But if our Lord says, no, let her go, they would have pulled him up and said, well, he's not following the law. What was Jesus' reaction? Well, his reaction was to stoop down and to write with his finger on the ground in the temple, which, interestingly enough, would have been stone. And the people at the back of the crowd, you can imagine the crowd's big, there's possibly thousands of people there all sitting down. They can't see what, if I stooped down now and wrote on the ground, there's no way they could see what I was writing. But you can imagine the people at the back of the crowd saying to the person in front, what's he doing? And they would have asked the person in front of them, what's he doing? It goes all the way to the front of the crowd until the people at the front that can see what he's doing. And, he's, and the message goes back. He's writing. And so it ripples all the way back through the crowd. Oh, he's writing. And they're like, okay, he's writing. What with? Well, and then it goes all the way to the front of the crowd. What with? And you go, his finger. Oh, okay. So it ripples all the way back to the back. And then the final question, well, he's writing with his finger on what? Well, it's on stone. Now this, I have been reminded, is unprovable, what I'm about to say, but it's, it's an interesting suggestion. So he's writing with his finger on stone. And straight away, I can imagine, everybody in the crowd would have turned their um, thoughts to what else was written with a finger on stone the Ten Commandments. And that's what I propose to you today, that he was writing on the ground. Just as God, when he gave the law to Moses, wrote on them two tablets of stone with his finger. And you see, he stooped down and he kept writing them. We're told them in Exodus 20. Don't have any other gods before me. Don't make idols. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Keep the Sabbath. Honour your father and your mother. And as he's been writing these, they continue to ask him. They think, they think they've trapped him. They think that he can't answer their question. But after he continue, they continue to ask him again and again, he lifts himself up from the ground and he says to them, we read it in verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. They would have known. Oh, and then he's sorry. They would have known what Deuteronomy says. If you have a case against someone, when you come to the judge, you have to be prepared. So Deuteronomy said, if you find somebody that's broken the law, and you want to take them to the judge to be held accountable, then you better really be sure that you've got this person because when they're found to be guilty, it's you that must throw the first stone at the person that has broken the law. So it was quite a compelling thing that you had to do if you wanted to take somebody before the judges. And so Jesus says this and he bends down again and he continues to write, I believe, the Ten Commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You don't bear false witness against your neighbour and do not covet. Verse 9 says this, And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Each one of them people were forced to consider their own past, their own life, their own sins. 
and they found themselves convicted and deserving of stoning. I'm sure if we reflect ourselves, I'm sure as I read out them Ten Commandments to each one of us, if we all did the same things the Pharisees did, stood up and walked out, I'm sure I now, including myself, would walk out, but we would, I would be talking to an empty hall, wouldn't I? We would all find ourselves guilty of breaking the law. But would we change our ways? Or would we be back next time with the same sins, the same complaints about others? The scribes and the Pharisees walked out that day, we're told from eldest to youngest. And as we get older, we're more aware of our failings, aren't we? I guess we have sinned more. And the older we get, we are reminded easier of our faults. These men went out, you know, but they didn't change their ways. You know, just in the next chapter, straight away, they were straight back in attacking Jesus again. They had no repentance or shame in their sins. They just wanted to elevate themselves and destroy others. And we too can be guilty of this, can't we? If we don't truly change our ways, but we continue on sinning the way we do. And when you think about the law, it says that they were supposed to bring the man as well, the adulterer and the adulteress. Have you ever thought, where was the man in this story? We don't see or hear anything of him, do we? He wasn't brought to Jesus to confess his sins. He didn't choose to acknowledge his faults or his sins. He just went on living his life. He never changed his ways at all from what we can imagine. Are we like this sometimes? Do we find it easier to not bring our sins before our Lord or to change our ways? I think we're all like this sometimes. And as friends, we need to remind each other of our need to confess our sins and to work on changing our ways. We'll read again at the end of verse 9. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw no one but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where were those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? I'm sure at some stage we all have felt a little bit like this woman. Have you ever stood up a little bit early for a hymn and been the only one at the front of the hall standing and everybody's looking at you? Do I sit down? Do I stand up? Do I just, what do I do? And there's nowhere near the amount of shame that this woman would have felt. Imagine everybody else around her is sitting down and there she is just standing alone with our Lord. You know, she gives us three great examples of faith. Number one, she never ran away. She stood there. She accepted her guilt. She could have just run off through the crowd and nobody would have probably tracked her down. Put it down to a silly little mistake. But she knows she stands there in front of all the people and our Lord. Number two, she made no excuses. How quick are we to make excuses for our mistakes? This lady didn't. She knew she'd sinned. She knew she'd done wrong. And there's no doubt that she was owning it. And number three, she professed that Jesus was the Lord. She chose to follow Jesus, to make him the example to follow. She has great love and respect for him and chooses to follow him. And Jesus says to this lady, go and sin no more. Go and change your ways. Don't sin no more. He clearly asked her to change the way of life. Don't sin anymore. It's obviously obvious that she would sin again. None of us are perfect. But Jesus asked her to stop that sin in her life. You know, the mercy of our God is great, isn't it? We just have to follow the process. Don't run from your sins. Don't make excuses. Work with God and follow our master and change our ways. 
And the fourth character we want to consider this morning is our Lord Jesus. He was perfect, as we've seen today. He is our example to follow. And when we find ourselves being like the scribes or the Pharisees, or maybe even the woman or even the unaccountable man, let's change our ways to become like our Lord. Someone that shows compassion and doesn't condemn others. It's interesting that in the same chapter he goes on to tell the crowd that he is the light of the world. We must change our ways also, mustn't we, to be like our Lord and shine as lights in the dark world around us. So let's this week try to reflect on this story from John 8. When we find ourselves looking over the fence to find faults with others, let's examine ourselves and change our ways. And if we find people that are struggling with sin, let's show them compassion and help them, not stand by and condemn them with others. When we struggle to see our sins or struggle to come to our Lord Jesus Christ with them, let's remember this story and have the courage to come to Jesus, to change our ways, unlike the man. Let's not run from our sins. Let's not make excuses. Let's follow our Lord that we have remembered this morning and we will remember in the bread and the wine and let's change our ways and let's shine like bright lights in this dark world around us.